this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another episode of Tabletops and Taverns. Continuing on with my series on old-school gaming concepts, we're going to take a look at what used to be a mainstay of an effective RPG party, but is now very much an optional rule set. Henchmen, hirelings, and followers. Or cohorts and followers in more modern systems. While some DMs don't like using these, they still serve a solid purpose for certain game types. And while henchmen aren't a terribly complex part of the game, let's talk a little about, a bit about the pros and cons of henchmen, what roles they can serve in a group, and hopefully this can help with the decision over whether to use them in your game. As usual, we will be talking mostly about the D&D versions of these concepts, but it should be applicable to other games in a variety of genres. So before we get into the various versions of the rules regarding henchmen and such, what are henchmen, hirelings, followers, cohorts, etc., etc.? Well, they all mean different things, although the exact terminology in D&D has at least remained relatively constant. All of these are basically NPCs that the characters in a party can either hire or obtain that assist them with various tasks. The degree to which they provide assistance and the general level at which they operate varies from edition to edition, but basically follow the following pattern. Henchmen and cohorts in later editions are lower-level adventurers than the main PCs that will accompany them and adventure with them, often receiving a share or at least a partial share of experience and likely loot in most cases. A hireling is generally a non-combatant such as an alchemist or a sage or a torchbearer, but some may be used for limited combat purposes, such as a guard. Most won't accompany the group on the actual depth of the adventure, although some, like torchbearers and porters, might at least go halfway. Followers are usually low-level minions that are attracted either by feats or by the acquisition of strongholds. They usually consist of rank-and-file soldiers, etc., although some may be of little bit higher-level officers. Some additions may, may grant certain classes less but more powerful followers, such as the rangers and second edition and so forth. They aren't really designed to go on adventures unless that adventure is military-based. Something like defending their master's stronghold or launching an assault on an enemy city might include th these followers. They may be useful for other labor-intensive tasks as well, road-building and the like. Followers, being as limited as they are, while they're always nice to have, it's understandable why some DMs simply skip them entirely. If your campaign doesn't include strongholds, and you can see my video on that subject if you haven't already, then followers just aren't that useful. Even in campaigns that do have followers, they're mostly left back at home guarding the character's stuff. Further, most hirelings aren't going to be much better. A lot of them will be left in town or be useful only for particular story-related tasks. Still, this leaves henchmen or cohorts in more modern games, and those hirelings that actually do accompany a group, at least in non-combat roles. And that's actually quite a lot of utility between those two major groups. In the third edition derivatives, the cohort requires a feat that may not be allowed by the DM, and only one can be obtained per character. Even so, this can easily double the party size if each person takes one, although that usually only happens in extreme cases. In older editions and other systems that mimic that style of play, a character with a high charisma might have multiple henchmen. A lot of times, these henchmen would be much lower level. In a party with several characters, with a few having, de having decent charisma, it wouldn't be unheard of to have two or three additional parties entirely worth of hangers-on, especially when you've got hirelings filling out the ranks. An important point to note here is that in 3rd edition, derivatives with the leadership feat at least, the PC may have a much higher degree of control over the build of the cohort, although they may start as existing NPCs. In old school style games, the henchman was already an existing NPC most of the time. Maybe even a non-combat hireling that's been upgraded to a more proactive role. Due to the nature of a lot of older additions, even if a player had some influence over their henchman's build, there usually wasn't much they could do with them. While all additions tended to give players control of their characters' henchmen or cohorts, they do still remain NPCs, and if the players running them act against the henchmen's nature, the DM is well within their right to take control of that henchman and overrule the player's actions. For adventuring hirelings, things are a little bit different. 
Generally speaking, they tend to be exceptionally low-level and are best suited for what might be termed camp tasks. Things like carrying luggage or holding light sources, guards to keep watch while the characters rest, or guides and scouts for particular areas that they are unfamiliar with. The crew of a vehicle the characters might acquire would count here, as would animal handlers if the characters don't undertake that task themselves. I haven't actually played in many games where, there, where these sorts of hirelings are used much, but I have to say that when they are in use, they're very effective, taking a lot of the burden off the player characters during the normal course of travel portions of the adventure. In one game, I was the only one to hire these sorts of NPCs, just a few porters to help carry things and a couple of guards to watch the camp while we slept or were away. It wasn't even that complex an adventure, just a few days travel to a dungeon and back, but they proved themselves worth the few gold that it took to hire them and helped open the eyes to the other players who hadn't really used hirelings before. Even as low level as these sorts of hirelings are, they can be of some use in combat as well. Not necessarily to actually fight, but if your DM allows you to hire a few basic soldiers or anyone willing to accompany your characters into actual danger, down a dungeon or the like, then you can assign them some low-risk tasks that make life easier. Now, these things get less important as time goes on and your characters level up, but for a low- to mid-level party without much in the way of magic, or those playing older editions or OSR-style games, their utility tends to last much longer. And if you're worried about your level 1 hireling getting one-shot or caught in an area of effect, these tasks can easily be foisted off onto higher-level hiring, higher-level henchmen as well. So what kind of adventuring tasks are suitable for hirelings? Well, there's the aforementioned light source bearer. If you don't have a mage or are playing a system where the mage has limited use of even cantrip-level magic, then vision and light becomes an issue at night or during subterranean adventures like dungeons and the like. If you hire a few stout-of-heart, low-level hirings that do nothing but carry a couple of lanterns and stay out of trouble, you can free an actual adventurer's hands up for something else, like carrying a shield or combat spellcasting. They wouldn't even have to enter into combat, just stick in the rear with the lanterns. If you have an archer or a caster who regularly stays in the rear rank, and such a system allows for such, Hiring a low-level soldier to do nothing but carry a tower shield or a pavis around and place it right before the, the actual character to provide some sort of cover uh, while the character just fires from behind that cover or casts spells or whatever. You know, a proper shield bearer that assists melee her heroes by covering their flank or similar such actions is probably better left for low-level henchmen, but the tower shield carrier can be undertaken by a character of any level. If your character regularly uses bulky thrown weapons or crossbows and the like, having a weapons bearer to keep a bundle of javelins or spears on hand or to reload spare crossbows could work wonders as well. You don't have to have that many class levels to do that sort of thing. The action economy of some systems may not allow that, but in others, the hireling could you know, hand over extra javelins as needed, spend their entire turn picking up a ditched crossbow, reloading it, and having it ready for the player character to fire in the next round, that sort of thing. Basically, if your DM does allow hirelings, there's a lot of little lifestyle improvements that can they can offer the party without being full-blown henchmen. If your game does have henchmen or cohorts, then a lot more options open up. Since henchmen are generally high enough level to actually assist in combat, a group of them can effectively double the party's effectiveness if, if they're played right. Now I'm going to put aside those games that allow full and total control of the cohort's build, because then you're really actually just playing two PCs, and can, you can go as specialized as you want with them. But for most games that I've encountered that allow henchmen, they're usually drawn from an existing NPC pool, which means that you have to rely on what the DM made them out to be. And usually, not always, but usually this means that they've got very simple builds. Not because the DM isn't capable of complex builds, but because the NPC is not there to be the star of the show. They're there to be an assistant, to help the characters that they hang around with and let them be that much better. And maybe, if the unfortunate happens, maybe then they can be heroes in their own right. The most basic henchman task is to assist with fighting. They can, of course, just walk up and wail away with whatever weapons they're given, but having a second character under your command can open up certain tactical options that is difficult to get to with other players. 
As I mentioned above, a shield bearer or defensive henchman uh, can assist with a frontline fighter, basically by occupying spaces so that it's more difficult to flank said person. They can sit there and just go full defensive and, and occupy a certain space, and then all of a sudden that rogues have a hard time sneak attacking that character, other people have a hard time sneaking around them. In these systems that allow for it, a full a shield bearer or a combat henchman can as- attempt to aid another just like penalizing an opponent's AC or attack rolls using the aid another action. While this may seem like a wasted opportunity, if an attack positively completely has to land, or if the damage potential for that one attack that the player is going to do far outweighs the potential from a successful henchman attack, that's actually a decent trade-off. A good example of this is some sort of uh, Yaijutsu samurai doing a you know, a Yajutsu strike with a Dragon Bane sword or a Something Bane sword, that it hit's going to do a shitload of damage. A good example of this is some sort of samurai doing a Yajutsu strike with a Bane weapon or something like that. That hit is going to do a ton of damage, so it's actually better in a lot of cases for the henchmen to just do everything that they can to make sure that attack hits. Another tactic for combat henchmen may be the shield wall or pike line. In your typical modern gaming group, there's around four to six characters, with most published adventures going for four. While this is a, with a good class mix, this means that there's likely just one or two people that can really prevent opponents from charging past that front line and wrecking your casters and your ranged person. This is all well and good for a 5 to 10 foot car door, but unless you've got some very specialized individual up front, any room that's bigger than about 20 foot across is probably going to allow gaps for enemies to get through. And don't even get me started about outdoors combat. A caster can help with this, but that consumes valuable spell slots. If you've got the henchmen for it, consider giving them shields and letting them fill in defensive gaps between the frontline fighters. Or better yet, slap some reach weapons on them and stick them in a second rank behind the front line just so that they can both serve as a block and offensive. In a wide room, this will allow your player character fighters to spread out some with the henchmen filling in the gaps. And in a narrow corridor, if the henchmen are armed with reach weapons, they can still fight from behind the front rank. So getting away from purely combat-oriented henchmen, perhaps the best use of them besides that is simply to fill in gaps in the party. Even presuming a well-balanced party, there's always going to be some sort of gap or shortfall in skills or abilities. Let's say your rogue decided to go all stealth and damage dealing and neglected the ability to deal with traps and locks. Time to pick up a henchman that can handle breaking and entering, even if they're not stellar at combat. Taking on a secondary cleric can allow your main cleric to take some of the minor healing and augmentations off of their line and become even more of a powerhouse up front and center. Maybe your group's arcane caster went sorcerer and focused just on damage dealing spells and you find your need of u- yourself in need of utility spells. You could pick up a wizard's apprentice or something to fill that slot. Another useful quality of henchmen in cohorts is that the player's main, if the player's main character is incapacitated somehow and not immediately available, a henchman will give that player something to do. This is especially useful in old school games, but even modern games may have circumstances where a player character is out for a while. Perhaps they got turned to stone or ravaged by disease and need to take time off to heal. Perhaps they just straight up got killed. Either way, the existence of a henchman in the party might give that player an opportunity to continue role-playing and contributing when you just can't you, when you just can't, you know, go back to town immediately to fix up their character. In a campaign or setting where you can't just quick fix death, that henchman may well become a full-fledged PC at that point. It's a much easier fix than trying to integrate an entirely new character into an existing storyline, especially if you're doing something like travel in a deep dungeon or something, and it's a place that another character or a brand new player character is not likely to just pop up. So we've seen some of the benefits of having a henchman and hirelings in the group, but there are clearly drawbacks. Otherwise, there wouldn't have been change from being an integral and expected part of an adventuring group to being an optional at best rule. Many of these criticisms of henchmen are are very valid, but there are ways to mitigate most of them. I'll go over some of the main ones I hear a lot, 
and offer some suggestions to help offset those criticisms. One complaint, and it's one that especially gets bad in more modern systems, is that the cohort will be customized or used solely to game the system. A player may turn their cohort into a magic item creating, creating factory, in fact, or have a cohort try to take additional cohorts at the very, or at the very least, a pet class. A very basic example of this is if a druid with an animal companion then takes a cohort that's also a druid with an animal companion, giving them the equivalent of four characters all under one player. This can be dealt with in a number of ways. First of all, the idea of a cohort taking another cohort or the like, you know, or a henchman, it, it just, it, henchmen can't have henchmen, full stop. There's, there's no other way around it. They are, by their nature, not leaders. And from a story perspective, it just doesn't make sense for them to have their own followers until they become a full-fledged PC, the hero of their own story, as it were. That having been said, things like animal companions or summons that are class features are, in my opinion, totally permissible. I'd let it go, but I can understand why some might, you know, be a little bit, uh, little bit uh, hesitant about that. In that case, just remember that cohorts and henchmen are still NPCs. Simply don't allow them to be classes that might pose challenges that you don't want to deal with. This can be applied in the case of the magic item factory henchmen. A DM is within their rights to simply declare that no NPC built for that sort of thing would want to follow the player character. They'd be out there making their own money. And yes, I can always hear modern gamers whining, that's abusing a DM's power. That's crushing my creativity. But even in 3.5, where cohorts are feat-based, it states that the DM determines the details of the cohort in question, though the player can request a certain class and race. It's only when you get to things like Pathfinder that they cede almost all of the construction power to the player, and even then I'm pretty sure a DM can make their will known. Before I continue, I will note this. I said that cohorts can't have cohorts, henchmen can't have henchmen, full stop. In retrospect, there is one caveat to that. If you're playing some sort of military-themed game, and the characters are expected to head their own sections of an army, then yeah, having their cohorts take other cohorts when the time comes can give them like a command structure. That's one way to simulate that command structure if you're not using other rules. Now, you know, now that I'm done telling DMs to crush your customized little cohort dream, let's take a look at another really valid worry. Party size. This can be especially huge in an old school game where parties tended to be larger anyway. Characters could have multiple henchmen and hirelings, and then things just tended to balloon from there. However, the effects are actually most noticeable in more complex systems, where even a standard character's actions in a combat round can take several minutes. Deciding on actions all the way around the table can slow a game to a crawl when it takes this long. This is also the most difficult one to mitigate, since it relies a lot on players actually paying attention. First things first. By the DM keeping henchmen builds simple, this limits the henchmen's options, thus resulting in a quicker turn, generally. That helps, as will hammering home the idea that players have to be considering their options before their turn, so that they don't spend several minutes just catching up to a situation that they should already have well in mind. I have a player in some of my games who is notorious for taking forever to make up his mind. In that case, I actually sometimes just put a timer on his turns so it doesn't take all night. If he doesn't make a decision by the time the timer's up, I just skip him. You know, his loss. One idea I use on occasion when parties plus cohorts are huge is to unify their initiative. Basically, I make it so the character and their henchmen all operate on the same count. It's not terribly realistic if you're actually going for realism, especially in games where there's individual weapon speeds and the like, but it does streamline the turns quite a bit. Regardless, the time a large party takes in combat is one of the hardest problems to mitigate. As for other consequences of a large party, well, as a DM, I actually kind of enjoy them. First of all, the battlefield gets that much more crowded. I like to think of it as a target-rich environment. Finally, enemy spellcasters might actually be able to get their to use their fireballs for proper, proper effect. 
Next is that all of those characters are a drain on resources. They have to be equipped, provisioned, mounts need to be paid for if necessary, hireling wages must be paid, henchmen sometimes get a share of the treasure recovered if they're not on a admittedly pricey salary themselves. All of this serves to drain the party's coffers. Again, I welcome this. It gives a solid opportunity to drain resources without resorting to contrived circumstances like robberies and the like, and it may keep the party just that little bit hungry enough so that they go seeking more adventures rather than having to be drawn into them with complex hooks. All in all, it's a net plus, at least for the DM. Some people don't like using henchmen and hirelings because both end up requiring much more overhead in terms of record keeping. I don't know what to tell you here. Yeah, they do. It sucks. And it's likely the DM and the player both have to keep track of things, because one or the other may miss something over the course of an adventure, either intentionally or unintentionally. I honestly can't help with this. What I can say is that in my experience, the extra bookkeeping is well worth it. Also, the DM should always keep an up-to-date copy of the henchman's sheet, just as they would a player character's. And one thing I actually hear bandied about is that large parties like this are unrealistic. I'd beg to differ on that. If you look back at the medieval period, adventuring warbands were actually a thing. There is safety in numbers, and they usually consisted of a cluster of nobles or other professional fighters, and then their various camp followers and hangers-on, squires, torchbearers, shield-bearers, cooks, porters, etc., etc. The number of people who actually did the fighting was very small compared to their support staff. Even bandits tended to have a fair amount of folk wandering around in the camp just to support the actual bandits going out there to rob people. If you look at a modern military squad, there's the squad itself that goes in and does the, does the actual fighting, but there's usually a lot of administrative and support staff that are back at base just to make sure they've got what they need to get the job done. Regardless, including hirelings and henchmen actually increases the realism rather than decreasing it, at least in my opinion. So henchmen have been a part of the game for a long time, like strongholds and another of other concepts that have, in recent years, been either set to the side entirely or somewhat downgraded in prominence. I completely understand those DMs that just don't want to deal with them, and that's cool. There are some downsides, as I've already covered. But if you're looking to run an old-school field game, even with a modern system, I do encourage you to allow them, or at least think about allowing them. And if you're in a game where your DM is open to the idea as a player, hopefully I've given you some ideas beyond simply just using them as cannon fodder. Let me know in the comments below if you've got any tales of brave henchmen saving the day or useful hirelings from your RPG days. I'm going to wrap this up here. This has been the RPG Crawler with Tabletops and Taverns. If you like what you've seen, remember to leave a like, comment if you've got feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content. If you want to get early access to videos like this or just help support and shape the channel, please check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash rpgcrawler or the links at the end of the video and in the description below. Until next time, take care and goodbye.